Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Seditionists with my friend Keith Reeves, and I'm Rob Furman. Uh, we're getting ready to go to ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education. We're both going to be doing various presentations there. It's, it's in San Antonio, Texas, so if you're in that area, drop us a line. We'd love to, to meet up with you. Uh, I'm sure Keith and I will be side by side for most of that conference. I go to all his things, he goes to my things, and we have a presentation together on the seditionist. So uh, it's going to be a great time. If you're out there, please show up. Um, today I brought an, a, a concept to Keith, and I think we've got, for the first time in a while, differing opinions on this. We might. But I'm sure at the end, I'm sure we're going to We'll agree on parts. Um, I just, being an elementary principal, we just dealt with our kindergarten screener. The expectations of what we want the kids to know coming into kindergarten. Now, we know with the advent of the Common Core here in Pennsylvania, they call it the PA Core, even though it's, it's Common Core, it's the same thing. We just have to put our name on it. Um, that things have changed. And, and what I'm seeing in the results of the data is kids that are coming in without any pre-k without any pre-kindergarten classes or anything like that are coming to kindergarten unprepared um, for the expectation of what we have as a state um, so it's, it's not a shoot the messenger type of thing it's i know this is the requirements that the state is, is saying we have to have and what i'm saying is the kids that have pre-k experience coming in the door are doing better right off the gate um, I know there's a lot of opposition to pre-K and those type of ideas, and even kindergarten for that matter, but it seems to me like those kids that have the that, that initial experience prior to hitting kindergarten are starting off at a bit of an advantage. Let's push it over to Keith, give him a chance. Go ahead, buddy. You know, I love I love pre-kindergarten as a concept. I think that, you know, the data is pretty robust in showing that children who have pre-kindergarten experiences thrive. Um, I will say I have seen both good and badly done pre-kindergarten. Pre-kindergarten here at Discovery, um, it's just a room full of joy, and it's not fluffy. Our, our pre-K instructor is extraordinarily talented, very strong with early childhood education, but the environment and the things that are done in that classroom are very pro-childhood as well as pro-child. Um, in a situation like that, in which a parent could very easily identify, they're very comfortable seeing that the child is able to grow up a little kid, and they're not being artificially pushed to get um, overly mature too quickly to be exposed to material that might be developmentally appropriate. Um, and certainly they're not going to be expected to conform to an institution early on. I think that everybody would probably agree like, well, that's great if everybody could have access to that. Where my concern comes in, well, I guess it's twofold. One, if a, if a, if a parent doesn't have access to what we would, like you and I would describe as excellent, I mean, excellent quality pre-kindergarten. Is that not an obligation of the system that is man that is asking for kids to be that far ahead? Doesn't that say we need to afford better early childhood and, and make it free to everybody? Um, isn't that now an expectation of a school system if the later parts of the system are going to expect higher levels of performance? My other thing, Hold on, let, let, let me touch on that. Yeah, real go quick for so it. We don't forget because I completely agree with you. I completely think pre-K should be in in, in the system without a mm -hmm. doubt. Just like if they want kindergarten to be as academically complex as they're as they're writing these standards to be, then then we should have a pre-K class without a doubt. Um, and the other thing I'm seeing is but that you hit on that I forgot is a lot of parents are coming to me saying yes I did have my kid did have a pre k experience but it wasn't it was daycare and daycare they, they tell the parents yes this this is pre k but it's not it is not your version like I'm sure you have at discovery and we have a couple quality programs here as well you know it is not a pre k academic plus the whole child experience it's basically babysitting and, mm -hmm. and, and parents are getting sort of rooked into thinking they've got a pre-k experience and they're not there you which go again is another horrible problem and if we would have that situation where our schools would have that like you do down at your school have it in, in, in the hallowed halls here 
we could really do some fantastic things. Go, go ahead to your second point. Well, I guess that goes to the heart of my second point, which is I have, and and as much as I think that there is, there is a demarcation between what we know as professional educators based on the literature and the lay opinion. We've talked about that a lot. When a person comes into my office and espouses something that is patently observably untrue, that is out of sync with the rest of the literature, I have a professional and ethical obligation, I believe, to educate that stakeholder, parent or otherwise, about what the truth is. That having been said, as much as I think that we can make a very strong case that children should have an opportunity to get immersed in learning experiences early on when they they're ready for them. There is a huge component of this that makes me go, well, this is why I have a problem with the state when it comes, and I mean capital S, when it comes to certain aspects of education. It is an entirely unreasonable thing to set a benchmark at, let's say, age five and say children must know this regardless of socioeconomic condition, regardless of their background, regardless of access to pre-K, regardless of quality of the educational opportunities that are near them, regardless of the working conditions of the family, regardless of the individual nuanced beliefs, modalities, preferences of the child and the parent, which may be valid. They're just going to say your kid has to know this before they come in. I would challenge someone to show me the evidence that that's a good thing. Now, granted, I think that the macro solution to something like this is to disengage ourselves from being bound to age. There are schools in Delaware that are doing that now. I write about it extensively in Insurrection that we shouldn't say kindergarten is age five. Kindergarten should be when you're ready for kindergarten, regardless of age. And yes, that poses its own set of complex problems. But my concern is the imposition of state mandate upon a four-year-old. A four-year-old is a four-year-old. They need to play. They need free play. They need exercise. They need good nutrition. They need hugs. They need love. They need validation. They need developmentally appropriate interactions. There are concerns even from ed tech about the overutilization of certain technologies in certain ways or the misuse of them. Conversely, I'm also concerned about the failure to expose kids to things that they need to be exposed to before they come into a public school environment. But are we really sure that it's a good idea to say we expect this prerequisite set of skills prior to school, it seems to me that if it's a set of requirements, it becomes school. And if the state wants to get into the business of having a pre-kindergarten formal program, now you're talking about having to apply the same requirements like the least restrictive environment, you've got to bring IDEA, it becomes part of the federal schooling program. That's a, that's a pretty complicated ball of wax to unwind. So I have some real concerns. Right, and and I think, and you're absolutely right. I mean, most of that I agree with. Uh, the play, I, I sometimes have a, a teeter-totter effect on that because that, that seems to be a very common uh, theme, you know, let kids be kids. There, I think there's a difference between what the layperson considers play and what I say Fair. the importance of play. Because sure. Playing is very important because you can learn a well. We know that kids learn most of, of, of their life skills in that in that birth through four by playing. It's their job to play. They learn so much from it. But I think when parents, lay people, say it, they don't understand that they have to be learning from it. So organized play, um, cer certain factions of play that can happen right in the classroom. You know, mm -hmm. right in that pre-K classroom as well. Um, but I think sometimes parents use that term play research to you know, leave my kid alone and let them go do their thing and play their video games for, for an extra couple hours as mm -hmm. opposed to going to pre-K. Um, but then there's also that part of things that, that we want them to know walking in the kindergarten. Like, for example, if a child's never been in a classroom, they may not know how to take turns, how to sit in a seat. How to take off their jacket, put it away, and be seated. Not that those are things that we can teach them in kindergarten, and we do, but but I, I think the expectation of of the state, which I don't necessarily agree with, but it's sort of the practicality of the whole thing. You know, those things, if those if those things could be out of the way prior to coming into kindergarten, then we can approach this other requirements that the state gives us um, faster. Because right now, and, and I'm running into a whole other problem of half-day versus full-day kindergarten. Mm. Uh, we're expected to do all of these standards in two and a half hours a day, which is right. like utterly ridiculous. So 
we're, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to fix the Common Core requirements tonight, you know. <laughs> so the practicality side of me says, parents, if you want your kids to, to, to have a good advantage in kindergarten, get them into at least some pre-K program to learn some of those basic experiences. Um, but then the philosophical side of me says, yes, we're asking them to do too much in kindergarten because of the Common Core. So it's that philosophy versus practicality that I'm fighting with. Yeah, from an ethics perspective, don't you fear that if that is the message that is sent from schools to say, if you want your kid to have a good experience and be successful, well, of course, that's a, it's a tautology. That's, parents are hardwired to want that unless there's something fundamentally wrong with that. It, it, it is, don't we run the risk of engendering, of, of instilling kind of like a pre-industrialization, we say, you know, your kid has to be ready to conform to social norms. Your kid has to be prepared to obey authority. You have, I'm not sure, given the radical's perspective, that there's already too much of that in both curriculum and in school, that we ought to be tearing down structures that impose coercive things on kids. And we are advocating for the anarchization of the classroom to empower the individual within scaffolding and developmental appropriateness. Don't we run the risk of unintentionally, perhaps, or intentionally on the part of the state, engendering this pre-industrialization to kids and say, well, parents, if you want to be a good parent, your kid has to know how to do these things. Well, what about the parent who isn't prepared for that? Special learners, kids who have a really high kinesthetic quotient, who need more stimulation, kids who come from a, a, an ESOL background, kids who might yet not be identified as an IEP, but there might be a deficit. Do we run the risk of putting lay people in control of things they ought not necessarily be control of and end up throwing the baby out with the proverbial bathwater. The possibility certainly exists, but again, I, I guess it's practicality versus the ethical realism extreme side of what you and I talk about. In yeah. a perfect world, I would love to be able to say to a, to a parent, when your child is ready, regardless of age, you know, when, when, when you feel like things are prepared, um, and, and I guess that's where working in the in, in the confines of, the, of what we're obligated to deal with I worry that I see so many kids coming already behind the eight ball and, and, and I'm not really sure how to even advise them even even the kids coming up like the three-year-olds and then the four-year-olds that'll be coming to kindergarten two years from now what I'm seeing is the state's expectations we have kids coming in without any pre-experience, they know very little coming in the door, then to, to, to our situation, they only have two and a half hours a day to get caught up on all the kindergarten requirements that the yeah. state has us do. I just feel like there's, a, there, there's, there's a, a, a real red flag here in terms of having kids be successful. Mm -hmm. now, it, you know, what I love to be able to tell the state stick their standards we're going to do it our way sure i would love to but that's that's just not going to happen next year you know there's like the long-term effects of the things that we want to see change but sure. there's also the uh, the kids that are still coming in the door this september and 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 i don't want to tell parents you have to go to preschool because there are some parents that do more at home with their kids yep. than any preschool could ever offer and it's amazing totally true. so so there's always that side of it too so, so it, and that's why I wanted to bring the topic up because there's really yeah. no great answer here. Don't we have an, now you, you and I, those of you who are maybe new to the channel, Rob's a principal, I'm an educational technology administrator. I'm, I sit on the admin team, but I'm not the, the decider. But insofar as one can be a decider in a school system, Rob's the decider. Don't we have an obligation in a situation like the one you're describing to, we have to assume that a, a constituent, a part of our constituent population will not have those prerequisites, will never get those prerequisites, and therefore it must be part of the kindergarten curriculum. Challenging as though it may be, don't we have to plan from a professional development perspective, from a pacing perspective, looking at the totality of the kindergarten year, half or full year or otherwise, don't we have to take responsibility for teaching all of those things? Like regardless of whether they have them or not, isn't Absolutely. that on us? Yeah, and we do, and, and we are. We, we know the problems there. It's, yeah. it's definitely something that's not only can be seen on a face-to-face -face level, but the numbers show it, the data shows it, and, and we do prepare for that. Um, 
it, it doesn't change the fact that I want parents to know that it's there and say uh -huh. whatever you can do to help prior to walking in the front door is going to be a benefit to you, to me, to the teachers, to, to the kids at large. Um, and, and, it's, and it's very interesting because in, in, in my, we're a very small district, as I'm sure yeah. many listeners have heard, um, we only have maybe two, maybe three pre-K, actual pre-K programs in our district. Oh, so, wow. So even the pre-K programs that the kids are coming from, we service like 29 different pre-Ks. Like parents will take their kids to, to their work or pass one along the road and drop their kid off on their way to work. So even the kids that have pre-Ks have all sorts of different skill sets co coming mm -hmm. from all over the place. And kindergarten and elementary is a very bizarre world because we start everything. Right. And, 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 and so I have more kindergarten conversations than probably anything else because we want that start just to be perfect. Absolutely. And that's sort of our passion at that, at that young age that I'm sure Discovery has the same feelings where we're setting the groundwork for everything. And, yeah. and it's, a, it's, a, it's a burden and it's Tremendous responsibility. Us. Yeah, it's an immense responsibility, exactly. So we have so many conversations about that because we want it to be perfect. Yeah. And, and there's some things that we're trying to do to get away from maybe the half day and things like that program because we know right now it, it's not perfect and it may never be perfect, but anything that we can do to, to enhance the situation is going to be a benefit to our kids. Um, maybe there, maybe we need to look at some resources that we can give parents who don't want to do the pre-K program to it. That, that maybe we could say, here's some things to play with because cooking can teach you about math and we know all these things. Sports can teach you about numbers and you know reading things and you know there are lots of things parents can do that could have an, an amazing impact yeah. on the kids when they hit that first day. Go ahead. You know two things came to mind and I'm glad to hear you say that because those were going to be my two questions to follow up. One is are there standard standards established either by your jurisdiction as advice or by the state jurisdiction for licensure that that delineate what a quality pre-K program should be like in Pennsylvania. And the second follow up is it, it it's one of those things it's unreasonable to this is andragogy and pedagogy both in the same stroke it's unreasonable to ask an adult to do something without teaching them how to do it so many times i find myself in situations where well i was told to do blank but nobody taught me how nobody oriented me to it nobody showed me that people are making these unreasonable expectations of me and i think that's just as cruel when it's done to adults as it is to kids so what resources are being provided to the parent if we're saying you have to get your kid ready to count to 20. It is on, we say all the time, parents are not teachers. Teaching is its own thing. So what are we doing to prepare the, the, the families in order to be able to provide that in a developmentally appropriate, loving, appro you know, a pedagogically appropriate way? Yeah, and, and I don't know how much of that's out there. Now, I know there there's those online type of pre-K programs, but I don't think that's I don't think that's it because I yeah. don't want a kid sitting at a computer for two and a half hours. At no, three we don't. Four and years of age. Families so, who don't know this, go look up the data. Kids should not at that no. age be using electronic devices and screens for that length of time, no. and in some cases at all. Right. So so that's not the answer because I know a lot of people right. will jump right to let's go to an online course, ABC Mouse, and those type of things. No, I, I'm just the opposite. I don't think that's appropriate. But no. I'm not sure what type of resources out there to to help parents who want to help their kids in that, in that respect. Uh, I'm going to wrap up and then I'm going to give you a chance to wrap up. Here's what I think we're saying. At least this is what I'm saying. I'll let you say what you're saying. Right? <laughs> uh, so what I'm saying is um, you know, I'm willing to help. Obviously, I've got, a re I've got my website, robferman.com. Call me. Let's talk about this. I will help with resources. Pre-K, I am pro pre learning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say pre-kindergarten because that sounds very boxy. You know, if a parent can do those type of things, do it at home. If you can do it in a, in a, in a daycare, great. If you can do it in an actual pre-K accredited program, that's fine too. But there are certain things that I think will benefit the child by knowing, just like you said, we can't expect them to do it if they haven't been taught it. There are some things walking in the door to kindergarten that your kids should know. Uh, at, at, at minimum, 
being able to sit in a seat, take off their jacket, deal with some of the organization of some of those basic things, knowing some basic letters and, and, and some numbers and things like that, it's going to help those kids walking in the front door. Um, I, I'm not... I'm not convinced, nor have I really ever been, that the that the box pre-K program where you go somewhere is appropriate. Mm -hmm. What is appropriate is working with your child, no matter what the option is. If you're a working parent, pre-K is perfect. But they have to know some of these things walking in the front door. And finally, I truly, truly, truly believe that public education should have a pre-K system. Because mm -hmm. if, we, if we're expecting it, we should have it. And if we had it, we would know how to deal with it. We are the experts. So it wouldn't have to be all day, every day, but it could be run similar schedules. But I do believe that we need to step up and, and help those kids. If, we, if, if this horrible standard system continues, that's the only way we're going to see nice progress because we are confined to certain laws. On you, buddy. It's interesting. You know, it was something I've, you, and faithful listeners, you've heard me say this before, um, but I often theorize, you know, I want to see my ultimate radical uh, agenda, if you will, is I want not just schools, but community learning centers that are open 18 hours a day, any age. We're now talking about a deficit, an identified deficit in a school system in which children of of preschool age, of young age, we're talking four years old, five years old, are not necessarily getting their needs met in a way that prepares them for what could come next if they're ready for it. On the converse, we often hear people talk about vocational education, community training, community reorientation, particularly to help communities that have been stricken by socioeconomic strife, and we talk about the need for those things. We have these public school facilities. I honestly continue to believe that this, I think we may have just identified another sliver of the larger whole of the problem of failing to consistently provide for the individual learner of any age from any background to get all of their needs met. Because certainly in this situation, there is a latent degree of state misperception of privilege in saying a four-year-old has to have this. There are families in every community, in South Park, Pennsylvania, in Arlington, Virginia, and everywhere in between and as far as we can reach, that aren't capable of providing that don't have the skills, the resources, don't have the inclination, the education. It isn't anybody's fault per se other than the state's. And so we have to do better. I think that we have to meet those needs more holistically. And like Rob said, there is research on play. It's fun research, but it's so we know what kids need. We know just like there's research on games. You know, it's a big part of what I do. Um, I think we need to get together and have those meaningful conversations and get more resources for more people. And it would seem to me, perhaps my final statement, if I am a leader that is responsible for kindergarten and I've identified a set of deficits that I need to address, it would seem to me from an ethics perspective that it is my responsibility to gather those and create some kind of program to give to my parents and say, this will help. If we don't do that, it seems to me that we are abandoning the adults as much as we are abandoning the children. And that may be a first on this show that I'm actually also concerned about the adults. <laughs> Good point. Good point. But but at, 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 with this group, we have to include the adults because they're going to be do. the people that are going to be pushing them in. Again, it goes back to the fact that kindergarten is the start of everything, and, and it's such a such a huge, enormous burden, fear that we don't that we do something wrong. We want to start those kids off right right yes, from the beginning. Do. Hey, that was a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed that one. Gave me some things to think about, too. I think we're going to look at doing some resources for our parents here in South Park. I think that would be really neat uh, because we need to do something, and I want to help out every child we possibly can. All right, so this is Rob Furman and Keith Reeves saying see you later. Don't forget to comment down below. Uh, shoot us some personalized comments in our emails. So if agree, disagree, we're okay. we got tough skin, and uh, we like to hear about it. And you can even see the first time he and I were sort of yeah. learning from each other as we go here and that's that's what's so great about this show uh thanks a lot and look forward to seeing you again soon